hope you have lunch already, less queues than yesterday. Um, I'm happy to see that many people here. Um, it surprised me to see that many people in a, in a talk called uh, Nobody Likes Working With You. Uh, it's interesting. Um, and I'm wondering, um, why are you guys here? Um, <laughs> it's because you guys know someone, ex-colleague, uh, current colleague, that you don't like working with. Uh, how many of you knows someone you don't like working with? Cool. Um, for those that didn't raise their hand, um, are you that colleague? Are you, <laughs> are you that person? Are you the person nobody likes working with? In, in any case, this talk is going to be good for you as well, because what we're going to talk here is about communication. We are going to, to discuss why communication is good, why uh, it's actually the most important thing in a team, and we are going to see four rules to improve your communication skills within your team. So let's get started. No. Okay. Let's get started. Yes. So let me introduce my, to you my friend Tom. Tom, we are going to use him as an example. He's the most experienced developer in his company. He's the rock star there. He's the guy. Every time you need to fix a complex problem, you call Tom. Uh, he's got a very deep technical background. And he's, you can say that he's been a while for a long. He's been a, around for a long time. So his most more important skills he has is this. So he knows all the existing design patterns. He knows patterns before they were famous. And he knows patterns so well that he likes to recite them every night before going to sleep. Um, he always writes very complex code because, as Tom likes to say, if it was difficult to write, it should be difficult to read. And um, he's always right. The guy is always right. Actually, the, la the only time he was wrong was one time when he thought he made a mistake. <laughs> when, when, there is, um, when the compiler can't compile his code, actually the compilers apologize to him because he's always <laughs> right. And the most important skill he has is that he can do pair programming with himself. <laughs> this is very important for Tom because nobody is worthy reviewing his code because he's the best. And I think you already got the idea, and I think you already know the guy. Maybe you don't call him Tom in your company. Maybe you call him Jing, or you call him Luis, or you call him John, or whatever. But he's the kind of person that you already met. The guys who raised their hands already met at some point. The truth is, nobody likes working with Tom. Nobody likes working with a kind of guy that always criticizes harshly when you make a mistake. This is the kind of guy that always says things like, how can you say that? That is wrong. That is bullshit. That is a mistake. It's the kind of guy that always dismiss the comments and suggestions for the colleagues and never listen to them. The kind of guy that never accepts critics to, the, to his work because, as we said in the previous slide, He's always right. So all of this makes him a bad software developer. Because why do we make software? Why do we create, why do we create software every day? We do software to create products and to solve problems, right? And without a good communication with people like this, it's simply not possible. Because if you think about the team where Tom is working, his colleagues are not questioning his decisions anymore because he don't want to engage in an endless discussion with the guy to end up him being right all the time. His colleagues have to stop innovating because every time you innovate on something, every time you try something new, inevitably you make mistakes. That's normal. 
you are learning, you are junior again, so you need to try something, you will make mistakes. But if you got someone like that in your team, criticizing you every time you make a mistake, at some point you will stop making the mistakes and will carry on and will stop uh, trying to innovate, carry on doing the same things you were doing before the same way. And all of this leads to a frustrated team, team that cannot do a good job anymore. It's a team that don't care about the code anymore. And a team that don't care about the code anymore works in a project that sooner than later will fail because that team just goes there, do the job, and go back home because they don't want to discuss with this guy all the time. There was um, Dominic Wilkins, who was nine-time NBA All-Stars, says one that you only as good as your team. And this guy was considered one of the best NBA players of all the time, so he knows about teams. So bad communication leads to, oh no. Bad communication leads to a bad team. Not because of the people. People can be awesome. But a bad team in the terms of how the team works inside. And a bad team will create bad products. So if you are a software developer, and for whatever reason, you are creating bad products, you are a bad software developer, no matter how good your technical skills are. But at the same time, if you are in a team that communicates well, have good communication, all this will be the other way around. You will create great products. So you will be a software developer creating great products, and you will be a great software developer because you're creating great products. So what we are going to see today is a four rules to improve your communications skills within your team to let you be a better software developer. So rule number one is this. Everyone wants to feel important. Everyone. This is a universal law. Me. You guys, everyone sitting here, everyone outside, everyone wants to feel important. You like that feeling. We like to be appreciated. We like to be recognized when we do hard work and we, when we put effort on something because we are social animals. We are humans are social animals. And we like the feeling of belonging to a group. And we like to feel important inside that group. For example, when someone remembers your birthday, or when someone likes a picture you post on Instagram, you like that because you feel recognized within your group. So the first step to improve your communications skills is this. You need to help others in their necessity to feel important. How can we do that? Everything starts with the names. The names are the first step on this path. So we need to learn the names of the people we work with and use them every day. It's not that difficult. <laughs> it's very simple. Just learn the name of the people and use them in your everyday communication. Because the name of a person is their greatest connection with their own identity. It's a sign of courtesy and a way of recognizing them when you use their names. For example, when you go to a meeting, after the meeting someone remembers you and greets you by your name, you like that. You feel more important and you feel that the person is recognizing you. This is something that even the tough guys knows. Right? Say my name. So the second, second thing we can do is show sincere appreciation. We need to appreciate and we need to be grateful for the small things people do around us. When a colleague stays after work to help us fixing something, we need to thank him because he's staying to help you. But not only in work-related stuff, when the, someone in the company organizes a barbecue, organizes some social drinks, and goes and cleans the kitchen, these small things people do, you need to get up and thank them because People are going to like this. People are going to feel more important. People are going to feel appreciated when you do that. And um, you should never miss the opportunity to say good things about people around you. It's very easy. Don't be shy on doing that. People will love that. Just 
and get up, go to your friends, and thank them for what they're doing. For example, in Novoda, in my company, I don't, I don't know if you can read that, but we, th we have a thanks channel in our Slack. It's a channel we use only to thank people publicly for the good things they do for us. It's the only use of the channel, and this is just yesterday. We use it all the time. People thank each other for help, for birthday cards, for helping organizing an event, for a cupcake, for anything. So find your way. You don't need the channel. Find your way. Yeah, I saw in a client, for example, that they have a big thanks wall in, in one of the walls in the office, and they were putting post-its and notes to thank people for the good things they do for each other. You don't need technology to do it. You just can just get up, go to the guy and say, hey, man, thanks you. Thanks for helping me on something. Don't miss the opportunity to do that. The third thing is um, to help people feel more important is to give credit. Do not limit yourself to point out what is wrong. This is something we as developers do a lot. So when someone in your team does a good job, give credit to them, tweet about them, Talk with other teams in your company, or with other colleagues, or with your friends, or with the internet. Give credit to your colleagues and to your friends of what the good things they do, in public and in private. So acknowledge the good things they do. For example, in the PRs, in the pull requests, everybody works with pull requests here? Yes? Good, good. So when someone opens a pull request, um, of code, what you usually do is you review the code of your colleague, and what, what we do as developers, usually I do it all the time, is just, this is wrong, change one line, too much space, wrong variable, blah, 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 but you can use that time also to praise the good things your colleagues are doing. This is a very clever solution. This is awesome. I like how you fix that. It's very easy. You are reading already the code. Don't limit yourself to just point out what is wrong and praise the good things your colleagues are doing. Arthur Conan Doyle says one that mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself, but talent instantly recognizes a genius. And that is very true. So the next time you interact with someone, remember how your actions are affecting their human need to feel more important and act in consequence of that. So rule number two. Don't criticize. This is something that goes against role, rule number one. Because when you criticize someone, you are offending that person and you are hurting that person. It makes the other person defensive and it's, in, it's because it's in our human nature not to admit our own errors. Nobody likes to admit their own errors. I don't like it. Most people don't like it. And what you will do if you criticize someone, the other person will seek for justification of the error. And then you will start engaging in a conversation that is not what you want to have. And also, critics are very sticky. So when someone criticizes you, you will remember that for a long time. More, some of you more than others, but people will remember that. But the good comments kind of vanish quickly, but the critics stay. And we need to think that for one moment, what is the goal? Why do we criticize someone? It's because we want to feel better and superior because we know the answer and they don't? If that is what we want to do, yeah, then critic is the right way because it's the only thing that is going to work for if we want to feel better criticizing someone. But how do you feel when, when your boss, when a relative, when a colleague replies with a critic to everything you do wrong. Who likes that? Nobody likes that. One guy in the back? No? No? Nobody likes that. Does not encourage you to do a good work. It doesn't work. So please don't become this person on your team. Nobody likes that. But you may say, okay, Luis, right, we cannot criticize. But I honestly, what I want to do when I criticize someone is help them to prevent an error, help them to improve. How can I do that? You can use constructive feedback. Instead of criticizing, you can use another method. 
what you can do is um, constructive feedback is a way of helping the other person in a positive way without offending them. You, what you need to do is praise the good things they do, don't focus on the mistakes, highlight the positive parts, and then try to move the conversation to what can be improved. Because we always just focus ourselves in the mistakes, but usually when people do some work, everything is not bad. There are some good parts. We need to praise that as well. And um, we need to avoid generalizing. When you say things like, you never pay attention to memory, or you never do tests, or you always define types wrong. Well, if you do it JavaScript, you don't have that problem. But <laughs> you always define types wrong and stuff like that. People can think that this is a, people will receive this as a personal attack. Because you are generalizing, you are not talking about the specific problem. And one very good uh, linguistic trick is try to replace in your sentence, in your feedback, the word but with the word and. Because when you say but, but is undermining what you said before. When you say, okay, this is good, but you, you fuck up in here, here, there. You, people automatically forgot about the other part. It's already erased from the memory, right? And if you use and instead, you, can, you have the opportunity to raise a question and um, move the conversation in a positive way. Let's see an example of this, because I think it's interesting. So, your colleague, Edward here, opened a PR. <laughs> and, um, and I say, hey man, we cannot merge this class. You always forgot to write tests, right? This is bad. This is bad because I am generalizing. You always forgot to write tests. And my friend can say, hey, but yesterday I did a test. Why can't you, you say that? Well, maybe not always, but most of the time. And you start discussing, and the person felt, felt that you are attacking themselves. And you are not discussing about this anymore. You are not discussing about this PR anymore. You are dis discussing about this, his pers this person's attitude and everything. So we can, do, we can improve this. We can say something like this. We can say, OK, this class is great. Because it's true that the class can be great. The man can, can forget about the test, but the class can be great. And we need to praise that as well. So this class is great, but we can merge it because you didn't write any test for it. Again, it's good because now we are not generalizing. We are focusing on this particular case. We are not attacking the person. But this bad is bad. Because the moment I say, but he already forgot about the first part. So we can do better than this. We can say something like this. This class is great. It will help us decoupling the business logic. Uh, how are you planning to test it? And the, at that point, the person, the question, the other person, with, using the question, the other person will realize that they made a mistake. Oh, yeah, fuck. I forgot the test. Uh, and you raise, in a positive way, you move the conversation into the test subject, which is what you want to really discuss. You guys need to think that um, probably you work with friends and colleagues and people you are used to work with, and you got a close relationship. For example, I'm working with Edward, and if he forgets to write a test, I will say, hey man, if you do that again, I will kill you, right? Because he's my friend, and we've been working together for a long time. But you need to remember that this won't always be the case. You will work in open source projects in the future. You will contribute to the community. You will contribute to big projects that will be on the internet for a long, long time. And everything you write on comments on PRs will be living in the internet forever. <laughs> and whatever tone or whatever jokes you do with your friends, it may sound funny with your friends, and your friend may understand, but then one person from Russia will read that comment and will think, this, what is this guy talking about? What a jerk. What is, why is he saying that things? Because they, they don't know the context. And after one year, the context will be completely gone. And if in the future you work in an international company, even if they are your colleagues, Maybe people from London don't understand your jokes. And you say things like, hey, you do that, I'm going to kill you. And they're like, 
what is this guy talking about? So mm, you need to understand that, that your sense of humor is not going to be the same sense of humor in London, in China, or in Berlin. And uh, you need to conduct yourself like in a professional way, in a serious way, in the comments that are going to be living in the internet forever. So be polite like this. Uh, try not to criticize and try to use questions to move the conversation in a constructive, positive way. This is rule number two. Let's see rule number three. Rule number three is this one. We already seen um, rule number two, don't criticize. Rule number one, which one? What was rule number one? Everyone, Everyone wants to feel important, don't criticize, and now Think what the other person wants. This is the most important one for all the sessions. So if you are only going to remember one thing from today, one thing, you can remember my name and you can remember this. Rule number three is the most important one. Because if you think of what the other person wants in your conversation, in your everyday communications, you're automatically going to follow rules number one and number two. If you are going to try to help the other person to feel more important because you are thinking in what they want and you won't criticize them. You're thinking about them. And um, we, need to, we need to stop thinking about us all the time. This is difficult. This is difficult, but we need to do that, therefore. We need to stop thinking that everything that surrounds us is about us because it's not. We need to start thinking in other people's needs and what is important for them. What are the goals and the motivations of the people, of our colleagues? What do they want to do with their careers? Why are they doing, why are they working with us at this precise moment? Why they choose what they choose and how, why they do, why they put more effort on some tasks and why they put less effort on others? What are their motivations? What do they like? It's not about us. Um, it's also when, when we have problems like your product manager comes and rejects a feature you've been working for a couple of weeks and you're like, fuck. And it's, instead of thinking from your point of view like this guy's coming here and destroying my work, try to think, why are they doing that? Why is it important for them to change, last time, change a meeting in the last time and put the meeting at 6 p.m. on Friday? Why is that important for them? Why are they dismissing your features? Maybe they have a boss as well that is putting pressure of them, on them and they need to react to that pressure and they don't know how to do it. So maybe there's a new opportunity for you to help them deal with this problem. So we need to learn um, the motivations of the people surrounding us. How can they do that? How can we do that? How can we be better in spotting what people around us want? It's very easy. Just listen. Listen to the people around you. Listening properly is very difficult. It's not easy. You may say, ah, I can do that by default. I just stay and listen. But it's not that simple. Being able to listen properly is the single most valuable skill you can learn. Because it will dramatically improve your conversation and your communication skills is something you will carry from one job to another. It's a skill that you will use all your life outside the work as well, talking with your relatives, with your friends, with your family. How to listen properly will make for a separate talk completely. It's a very big topic. There's a, there's a talk in TED, 10 ways to, be a better con to, to have a better conversation by Celeste Hetley. It's really good talk. I really recommend you guys to watch this. Um, she, Celeste, she hosts uh, daily news shows in the Georgia public broadcasting. So she's been doing interviews for the last 10 years, I think. So she knows what makes for a good conversation. She knows how to listen. She's giving you like 10 tips to do it. So watch that. We, I cannot summarize everything here, but I want to take like three points from her talk, which are very good. The first one is when you're talking with someone, you need to listen and be there in the moment, in that moment. Don't be talking with someone using half of your brain to think what you need to do afterwards, what you are going to do, what, what, 
what you were doing before, what you want to reply later. Just use all your attention to focus on what the other person is saying. Don't be like Batman. Nobody likes that. Don't do that. Bill Nye. You guys know Bill Nye? Bill Nye is the CEO of the Planetary Society. He's a science educator. He's a mechanical engineer. He's best known for hosting a children's science show, the Bill Nye Science Guy. Uh, yeah, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, and he says, everyone you will ever meet, everyone you will ever meet, knows something you don't. So use the opportunity to learn from them. Everyone around you today in this room, on your left, on your right, knows something you don't know. Talk with them after this talk. Learn from them. Use the opportunity to listen to the people and learn what they know that you don't know. It's a unique opportunity. And uh, remember that um, a conversation is it's not really an opportunity to show how amazing you are. Sometimes we are in a conversation and we are waiting just for our opportunity to say, hey, hey, I already do that. And uh, I've been in that place as well and it was awesome and I did this and I did that. And it's not an opportunity to show how great you are. Conversation is an opportunity to listen to the other person, learn, because we said, as we said before, people know things we don't know. It's a great opportunity to learn from them and try to find their motivations, their goals, what they want. So listen to people, pay attention, and learn from them. OK. So now you know how to listen. Listen to me, because the next rule, rule number four, is the secret to win any argument. That's good. The sec you wa guys want to say that? The secret to win any argument is to avoid the argument. Sorry. <laughs> it's the only secret. All arguments are bad. All the arguments are bad. Why is that? Because, as we said before, we are social animals. That's why we have the rules number one, number two, and number three, and that's why they are so important. And every time we have an argument with someone, we go against these rules because we're trying to impose our, our point of view. So we are not going to think about what they want. We are thinking about what we want. We are going to criticize them because we don't give a fuck. Um, we are not going to pay attention of the, on their need to feel important. We want to just push our arguments. But the problem, the problem, the, how many of you are developers? Okay, good. <laughs> so the problems developers have, we have, I have, is that we like discussing. We like discussing. We have a logical mind. And discussing with a developer is like wrestling with a pig in the mud. So after a couple of hours, you realize that actually the pig wasn't joining. <laughs> that happens. That happens all the time. Been discussing with my colleagues two hours. After two hours, you are like, what, what was this about? <laughs> Why did we start? So we, we like discussing. We are developers. We are engineers. We like solving problems. That's fine. But the problem with discussing is that you may use your logic to impose an argument and convince the other person about something. But, and, and you may win the argument, that's fine, but you are always also going to win an enemy. People don't like to lose discussions. But sometimes there are disagreements. Sometimes you have one point of view, the other person has another point of view, and you need to solve that, right? What can we do? How can we solve that? if we cannot have arguments. We are going to see simple recipes step by step of what you should do whenever you have an argument with your colleagues. The first thing is don't get angry. Don't get angry. It won't fix the problem. 
it only makes things worse, won't move the conversation forward in the right way, it won't help anyone. No. <laughs> Next, this is, you know this? This is the, the first, the plain directive from the retrospectives. It's complicated. So this is something I deeply believe in, and it's something I always have in mind whenever I need to discuss with someone and in my everyday mindset. It says, regardless of what we, it's longer than this, but this is the summary. But the, the whole thing is, regardless of what we discover, we understand and we truly believe that everyone did their best job with they could, with the knowledge they have, what they knew at the time, and their skills and abilities. We need to think that when people do something different from how we want to do it, or when people do something that we believe is wrong, most of the time it's not because they want to annoy us. It's not about us. People do something wrong because simply maybe they don't know how to do it better. So it's a great opportunity for you. If you know how to do it better, teach them. Let, let them know what you know. It's a great opportunity when you have a disagreement to teach your colleagues how to do things better instead of arguing. So having this in mind and the other thing, not get angry, the first thing we need to do when we have a disagreement is find a common ground. For example, you have a disagreement on tests. You want to do tests somehow, in a way, and your colleagues want to do it in another way. Instead of discussing in the final step, you need to set a common ground saying, OK, first of all, do we all agree that we want to have automatic tests in this project? Yes, we all agree. Do we all agree that we want the CI to run the test in every pull request? Yes, we all agree. OK, but I want to do the test this way, and you want to do the test that way. OK, yes. Now we can discuss about that. But we have a huge common ground now. We have a goal we both fighting for and we aim for. So now the disagreement doesn't look that big, because having set up all this common ground, we share a goal as a team. And the problem is not that big anymore. The next thing you need to do when you have a disagreement is avoid saying things that you are wrong. That is wrong, and you should not do that and feel ashamed. Don't do that. Instead, if you think that the other person is wrong, ask questions. You think the other person is wrong because you think different, right? And if I say, my colleague says, we should use mocks uh, everywhere in the test. And I think that that's a bad idea. I think that's a bad idea because of something, because I know something that maybe they don't. So instead of that, what I should do, instead of saying, using mocks is a stupid idea and you're a stupid person and you should feel ashamed. Instead of saying that, what I should do is ask questions saying that, why do you think that? It's not that going to be a problem in this case. It's not that going to be a more complicated to test in these certain scenarios because these questions are really my train of thought. I came to the conclusion that the using mocks in this case is wrong because in my mind I've been through all these questions, all these possibilities, and I realized that may be a bad idea. So show your colleagues your train of thoughts. Ask questions. It's a great way of teaching them. And you will be surprised that asking questions most of, more than one or two times, you will realize that actually the one that was wrong was you. And maybe you are wrong, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. We are all in the same team. This is not a battle. This is, this is not a competition. We are all in the same team. We share a common ground. We, we establish that before discussing, in step zero before discussing, we establish the common ground. So if you realize in the middle of the conversation that, oh, shit, I was wrong, just admit it immediately. Meet it immediately, it will put the other person in a less defensive position, and you will move on solving the problem you want to solve. It will help people uh, recognize their own mistakes. They will be less defensive, so we will be more willing to admit their own mistakes as well, because it's not a battle, it's not a fight. We are all in the same team. 
But if still you are convinced and the other guys convinced that they are right, postpone the discussion. Don't sit down discussing all the time. Postpone it. Just agree with your colleagues and say, look, you think A, I think B, you think white, I think black. Let's do something. Let's go home, read more about the subject on the internet, read more on a book, on this book, come again tomorrow with more information about it, and we can discuss from a different point of view. Next day, the ideas will be fresh. Next day, you will want to be that tired, and you will see the problem from a, dif from a different angle, different point of view. It will be easier to come to an agreement. But again, if after this, you are still convinced of your point of view, or your colleague is still convinced of their point of view, you need to, we need to learn to give up. This is tough, but you need to learn to give up. If at some point of the discussion, the problem is not um, a risk for the project, it's not a, something you think it will break the project and will uh, uh, make the experience worse for the users, stuff like that. At some point, we are just discussing personal preferences because we know that in software, nothing is perfect. All solutions got trade-offs. And now you are discussing your favorite solution because you like it and it's your solution and your colleague is discussing the same thing. So at some point you need to think and you need to ask yourself the question that if this is a battle that is worth dying in. Because if it is not, we need to learn to give up our point of view and accept our colleague point of view. Even, this is even more important if you are in a responsibility position, if you are the team leader of your team or the CTO or something like that, it will teach your colleagues and your, the members of your team a very valuable lesson. It will teach them that their opinions are taken in consideration as well, that you are not dictating what should be done. It will make them more valuable because they will, they will feel that they are contributing with the team and their ideas are heard. And also, they will learn that there's nothing wrong in giving up and admitting your own mistakes. It's a very valuable lesson to give up. So these are the four rules we've been discussing today. Everyone wants to feel important. Help them with uh, your actions. Don't criticize because it hurts the other person. Use constructive feedback. Think what the other person wants. This is the most important thing. Try to see the life from the other person's point of view and try to avoid arguments. Try to follow these steps, not discuss with your colleagues. So finally, I want, would like to end with this quote by Ludok. No one can, can whistle a symphony. It takes an orchestra to play it. So if we apply these rules to everyday communication, we are going to have a better team. A team that is going to be motivated because the ideas are taken in consideration not afraid of innovation, because if you make me taste, they are not criticized. People that shine and do their best because members receive credit for the work they do. And all of this will make a team that will create great products. So when this talk finish, go out there, listen to people, help them achieve their goals, and make an awesome team. Thank you. Questions, critics. <laughs> um, I'm a developer, but sometimes I have to make some interview for you people coming. Yes. So uh, my my I have to meet a lot of technical questions. What's your background and so on? But the, uh, yes, what's the but at a certain point, I want some techniques to understand. If the person I'm in front of is the one that you don't want in your company, is so, there any way? So what we do in, at Novoda in, in our company is, for the technical interviews, 
what we do is we do a couple of pairing sessions. So we, the person that comes, we ask technical, technical questions, that's fine. What is the, how is the memory managed in Java? What are the types, blah, 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 other things. But then you need to really work with that person. The best way to do it is pair on something. Take the person one hour in your office, pair on a kata, something like that, work with them. Working with them, you will see how they react to problems, stuff like that. And then what we do after a couple of sessions of pairing, which is already a very good indicator, we go out for a beer. It's the best way. Sit with the person in a pub, having a beer, and talk about whatever we like talking all the time. Apps, stuff like that. And you need to think at the end of the day, if I have a problem Saturday, if I need to be in the office Saturday night, 2 a.m., fixing a bug in production, will be this guy, the guy I want to be with? If the answer is no, probably it's not the correct guy. That's it. <laughs>